big fish is a recognizable landmark of the city with millions passing by here daily. But how many realise its designer John Kynes had his artistic roots in Belfast comics with titles like The Belfast People's Comic and The Hand, A Tale of Old Belfast. Over the course of this documentary, we're going to be looking at what has sometimes been called the invisible art and how this rich heritage bonds the memories and practices of the community and what it offers today's generation of cartoonists. John Kynes is a head librarian at the Lynn Hall Library and curator of its political cartoon collection. People have a, a great tendency to poke fun at each other and the cartoon is one of the best pictorial ways of doing this. And I think it goes right back to ancient times. Now one particular cartoon that I um, am very impressed with is this portrait or cartoon of Sir Edward Carson. It's very stylized. it's almost Germanic in its, its um, pencil work. Modern cartoons, they're really a social history, you know, they're, they're a commentary on what activates people's minds, what, what enrages them, what pleases them. The person who signed it signed his name QED and it appeared in a very short run Ulster periodical, Ulster Opinion. Now I've only seen five cartoons by this man QED. I'm astonished that Someone with that quality of art hasn't a much bigger canon of work, but it's a really important stylized cartoon of Sir Edward Carson. Now they're an ephemeral thing in that they're there for one day, but an archive of this material will give you a great insight into what happens politically in any country. And the cartoons here in The Unkindest Cut look at the history of Ulster in the 20th century, and they do tell the story in a very amusing but also a very um, poignant and, and very specific way. One great source of cartoons that we may overlook is PTQ, the uh, student rag from Queen's University. This is the 1936 PTQ and when you open it up it has cartoons all the way through. This is actually um, a build up to World War II and it's titled Pax Germanica and here we have Mussolini, Hitler and someone else whom I don't know but the armaments behind and this is a, a cartoon called Nightmare and it shows Eamon de Valera on the white horse parodying the um, William III at the Battle of the Boyne. Could you elaborate on what the unkindest cut is? Yeah well the title comes from um, a cartoon that appeared in Punch around um, 1920 and it was do to do with partition and it shows Lloyd George with a map of Ireland, a pair of scissors, and he says, I now cut this map in two, put it in the hat, and we will find that over a period of time, it will have come back together magically. And aside, he says, at least I hope so, because I've never done this trick before. So he called it the kindest cut, but because partition is here and because of all the trouble that we've had over the century, I renamed it the unkindest cut, and I think it works very well. Going right back to the, the start of the century, there was a, a magazine published in Belfast called The Republic, and it was published by the um, Dungannon Clubs, but it had some really important artists, uh, John Campbell, the Morrow Brothers, they, they went on to become fully-fledged artists in their own right. Then, coming through things like PTQ, you see the fledgling um, Roald Friars, and I think Roald Friars comes through decades of Ulster history, right up to the present day with Ocean and Cormac, Ian Knox obviously, um, and Martin Turner in the Irish Times also has you know, cartooned and lampooned the, the politics of Northern Ireland. So all tell our story and it's quite important to look at it. But it's in the 30s and you can see cartoons used as advertisements, Robinson and Cleavers. Um, here's one for Finlay Soap. No Soap Here, which is a parody on No Soap Here.
This is the uh, Black Box uh, Black Market, the first Sunday of every month. This is the grassroots, this is this, this sort of where it all starts and, uh, and more the real heart of the stuff that finds itself in the mainstream. Uh, this is where it all sp springs from. We have the finest range of comics north and south of the border, all homemade, all DIY. Most shops won't stock these, they're only available through mail order or on the web. Um, but we have them all here in Belfast, this unique cultural hub. Well, we've got uh, comics by myself, 24 hour comics, written and drawn in 24 consecutive hours. No breaks, no stops. We've got Paddy's own cattle at Cooley, which is retelling the Ulster cycle historic of Colin. I guess we'd be, we'd be talking about tw 20 to 30 comics on an average day, we sell. Um, which doesn't sound like an awful lot, but when you consider that this this and um, occasional one day events like this are the main selling point for these creators is, is quite a bit. And they'll be maybe doing very small print runs. Mine tend to be about 10 copies. Uh, I think on average, maybe folk will do about 100 copies. Right, uh, Stephen's books. Do I have them down there? there? No. Oh, about 250 or something like that? I think so. Bad chemistry is 150. And what's Archie's? It's 450. Find a selection of cartoonists or comics by cartoonists from all over Ireland, including ourselves. Variety of comics from various artists from all over Ireland, including ourselves. Comics are, for me, like an absolutely vital part of sort of underground culture and counterculture. Any black market that I would do, I would expect to see comic book sellers at it. And don't scare them off. <laughs> Here we have a chance to talk directly to people, to sell directly to any money we make goes straight to us. Any money we invest comes straight back to us. These two here, Supernatural Showcase, which is a very, very funny spoof horror comic. And we have Waiting for the Mothership, which is Gary Rowan, who does these sort of, sort of personal vignettes and uh, musings. And, right. Very good. Which is kind of imaginative and odd. <laughs> The fact that we can be approached as well, that, that people can come up and say, I like what you did, or tell us what you did, and we can talk to them, uh, extends that narrative. Um, and also just to be in here with so many other people doing, like Adam was saying, different things. I make things out of inner tubes of bicycle tyres. The black market is a fantastic place to talk to people about the products and to sort of make people aware of what it is that you do in Belfast. This is quite important to the various cartoonists that are on the stall. For some of them, it's their only outlet for the public to see their work. That's true, well, it's the only regular one. I mean, there are occasional fairs. If you have a, a regular outlet like this, then you, you can create a little bit of a scene. And I think it's always best to be part of something rather than isolated. Do you see signs of much growth in the comics arts in, in the north of Ireland? There's certainly signs of it, yeah. I mean, there's, uh, as well as the people we've got here, we've got people like Miguel Martin, who does the Weekly Woe, and we've got Stephen Morris Graham, who does 400 Facts, who have, who have done the black market on their own bat occasionally. And we have the monthly pub meets that we've been doing for the last few years that seem to be getting, going from strength to strength. So there's a little bit of a scene, and uh, a lot of talented people. This one here, this is your 24-hour comic. Ah, yes. Could you tell us a bit about this, please? Yeah, it's, a, it's an annual event, 24, 24-hour comics day. Chuck McLeod started it. But uh, the idea is that for a single 24-hour period, 12 o'clock to 12 o'clock, you sit down and you create a comic. 24 pages, 24 hours. This year I decided to do one for children. 
and I wanted to do one in colour as well, so this is what I've come up with. It's a little fantasy story about two children that step through a magical door into a, a strange world and where there are soldiers and dinosaurs and wicked queens. <laughs> Davy Francis is a recurring figure in Belfast comics. The 1980s began with his contribution to anthology Zemoc. By decade's end, he developed Belfast's first real superhero, the amusing Cider Man. I started off when I was in art college. I started off in uh, the graphic design course. And um, what happened was I uh, had to do a project for the end of the year. And I thought I'd do a comic because I always, you know, enjoyed comics. So I had produced a, a mural for the students' union up in Jordanstown, and uh, they said, you know, well, we, you know, we'll pay you for it. I said, well, I'd, if you don't mind, they had their own print room. So I said, uh, if you print the comic, that would be far better. So they printed 500 issues of it, and. Uh, I think I sold about a hundred of them, so... <laughs> a couple of years after, you were involved in the Belfast People's Comic? Belfast People's Comic, yeah. It's John Carson and myself, we went along to see the guys, Alistair McLennan and uh, Ian Knox were there. They said, oh, we're putting together a comic, you know, and we'd just like to put a few pages together for it. Can you tell us about the sort of content that was in the People's Comic? Well, it was um, vaguely political, but it was a very down-to-earth sort of, uh, you know, just make fun of everybody type of strip. Uh, John produced a strip, I think it was for the first one, called Spot the Difference. And it was, you know, allegedly the differences between the two sides, uh, the, the eyes are wider apart and this type of thing, you know. Stupid old myths that um, he just made fun of. John and I were um, selling the People's Comic one day up in the Polytech. We sort of had a run in with some of the students there who felt that maybe some of the work in the comic was a wee bit too political. I sort of realised that, you know, I wasn't really cut out for the political um, sort of strips. Whenever we started Zimok, that was one of the things we laid down from the start, you know, that we didn't want to make it political. We wanted to just make it accessible for everybody. And we wanted to sell it, you know, not just here, but, you know, down south and over in England and UK and that type of thing. Zimok was another of those um, anthology comics that uh, drew in a lot of people who later went on to do other stuff. Um, Will Simpson, Hilary Robinson. Um, I was wondering if you'd uh, tell us a bit about the origins of Zimok. I uh, wasn't working then, and, uh, and so what I did was I went down to the Art and Research Exchange offices. They gave me a wee office, a wee desk where I sat and, you know, was working on the screw the bat and head the ball, you know, for, you know, the eight hours that it took me to draw it. And then the rest of the month I would just sort of draw and people would ask me to do posters and that type of thing. So it was sort of base to work from. And then um, I got a call one night uh, from a very soft-spoken young man and uh, it was uh, it was Will Simpson. We could talk about comics and this type of thing. And uh, we sort of oohed and aahed at each other's work. And we decided that it'd be nice to, to do something together and sort of showcase our work. Uh, Ray McAvoy came along too. You know, we sort of got the first issue together. And once with the first issue out, then we found that a lot of people came in and got interested. Peter Morwood, Hilary Robinson, and uh, Ivor Lavery. Um, Bob Kern. We all chipped in to, to pay for the uh, printing costs. I think it was £20 we paid. It was all very, you know, uh, democratic and, you know, sort of, uh, you know, if somebody wasn't happy with the work that was produced or didn't feel that it fit in, you'd go back and change it or do something about it, you know. We all sort of listened very much to each other's views and the, the way that we wanted it to go. So it was very creative, creatively energised, you know, and uh, we sort of, uh, we went from monthly meetings then to every, fort every fortnight we'd have a meeting, and then I think it was every week. But then gradually it tailed off, other people were getting all their work, and it ended up really, it was just Hillary and myself were producing the, 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 um, the comic. By the time it, 
as she had came round with that. We give it a rest because but nine pounds in the bank account and it didn't cover the printing costs for issue nine, you know. How did you go around getting ZMOC to to people? Well, the, we went to uh, we, the very first issues. We would have gone round pubs and uh, sold them to people. The only thing trouble with that is, you know, you meet always meet somebody you know and have a drink with them, and then you know you forget them or <laughs> forget the issues, and you know have to go back for them the next day. Uh, but then we went through record shops like Terry Hooley was always very good at taking uh, copies of us and then we had the mail order as well. We would have uh, advertised through Fast Fiction uh, in England, Ed Pinsett, he ran that. And uh, you know, we'd, we'd go over to Westminster Comic Mart and that type of thing. But it, it just meant that more and more people got to know about them and we'd get more contributors that way, you know, people from England. and. You sim sometimes you get kids writing and saying, when I grow up, I want to be an artist on ZMOC, you know, and this type of thing. So it's... Uh, nice to have a fan base. It's nice, uh, looking through some of the old files, it's nice to see the wee letters, you know. Tell us very quickly about Ciderman. Ciderman uh, really came on from uh, from the last issue of ZMOC. It was uh, an A5 issue, and uh, I liked the size of it. And I'd been starting to draw you know, episodes of Cider Man. Uh, I was drawn for Oink at the time, but I just loved drawing so much. You know, I'd come home, draw or write a strip for, for Oink, and then you just start drawing Cider Man. And, you know, I was doing like four pages a night. So, you know, I had to sort of publish them somewhere. I still have about 100 pages unpublished. And uh, Funny Ha Ha was the, was the vehicle for it. But I wanted to bring in, you know, we things like comic interviews and you know, that type of thing as well, make it more sort of, more like a magazine than a comic. And they'd written off to, you know, people like Ronald Reagan and William Shatner and people like that and got their, got their, uh, you know, autographs. So they became the celebrity cider fans. And uh, it was just a bit of fun, you know, but uh, it's just uh, somewhere to put it all, you know. <laughs> John Farrelly is a comics artist from Newry. He's also the creator of early 1990s comic, Nuts, Screws, Washers and Bolts. The rude version and the clean version, you want the clean version? All right then. Uh, a lunatic escaped from an asylum and he uh, went into a laundrette and made love to all the women in the laundrette and then ran away and the newspaper headline the next day was Nuts, Screws, Washers and Bolts. Did I hear tumbleweed there? Was there a tumbleweed there? <laughs> that, that was, I was very excited about nuts, screws, washers and bolts because I got together with some like-minded people I hadn't met before. I happened to pick it up in Dark Horizons, I think it was, and I went, ooh, this is done by local people. And all I wanted to do was get into comics. I didn't care how, where all I loved, I loved drawing comics, and all I wanted to do was get into comics. So to see that there was actually people from Belfast, and I had just moved to Belfast, and I got in touch with them, and uh, Paul McCullough, and Alan Perry, whom I'm still friends with Alan now. Paul I lost touch with, but one of the most talented, everything, I, I, I hate him. We put together a comic called Nut Screws, Washers and Bolts um, after a really bad joke. Got a lot of uh, contributions from people all over, all over Northern Ireland, really. And it was just whenever we got the time, we got together, had a laugh, had a few drinks, uh, put it together basically in, in the living room. I think it reached issue four. Um, and it had the distinctive sort of garish yellow cover with a black sort of tape down the spine. The first two issues, I think, had that. Uh, sort of done on the on the sly, photocopy very, very cheaply on the sly, you know, sort of in work, you know, trying to get it photocopied and, and stapled together. I've sold it through the Students' Union and the Talisman took some as well. The comic shops, Dark Horizon, things like that, sale or return basis. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> DNA Swamp was an ambitious collection leaving a lasting impression of the Ulster comics scene, an ensemble of high-profile Belfast creators' work appearing in Main Street newsagents. It was ambitious. We got funding. We scraped together the money to, to do a couple of the first two issues and got contributions from professionals that we thought would help sell the comic. Frank Quitely, uh, Glenn Fabry, Colin McNeil, 
a few others. Um, Philip Blade, he was a local local artist. It started off quite small whenever we were talking about it initially it was going to be like a small self-published thing and this was when self-publishing was actually quite expensive to, to do. It's, nowadays it's, it's dead cheap but when we were starting out it was thousands and thousands to get a, a relatively small print run done. But the sales were quite healthy, the sales were quite good you know and uh, we got some good stuff in there and there were some good stories critically uh, it was, it was uh, well received. It's just unfortunate it was one of those things it died off. The DNS one turned out to be come back and bit me on the ass basically uh, because it was so much work and so little return and it, it became a money venture. Funding ran out, enthusiasm ran out and friendships ran out. <laughs> so it was one of those things, it's, it's a bittersweet sort of experience for me apart from being one of the best, the launch being one of the best days of my life, I thought oh no I have to do this every month now and I had a full-time job at the time and, you know, kind of fizzled out. John now teaches comics at the Crescent Arts Centre, passing his learned skills onto a mix of people. I'm hoping that they're getting the enthusiasm that I would have for the, the medium for and for storytelling in general. It's not even particularly comics. I like cart cartoons and creating cartoon characters and things like that. It's not just about comics or, or storytelling. So I would hope that they would get the same sort of things out of it that I always got, which was sort of a, a love of, of creating something out of nothing. Holy Cross was a series about a gay couple in North Belfast. Drawn by Davy and Paul J. Holden, it was published by US outfit Fantagraphics. <laughs> Ed Stiles has always been very cartoony and, and had an awful trouble whenever Mal asked me to do Holy Cross because I was sort of thinking to myself, well it's supposed to be, you know, it's like a serious story yeah. and it covered serious issues and I had an awful, which I kept thinking to myself, he's got the wrong guy to draw it, you know, but then I thought, well, you know, he's asked me to do it so I may as well do it and do it as best as I can. Uh, so it was thrown in things like, uh, you know, places that I knew, like the old Alpha cinema in Rathcool that makes an appearance somewhere up West Belfast for some reason. <clears throat> I did something similar. There was a lot of um, there, there's a lot of bits of Belfast from what I remember uh -huh. rather than from actual Belfast. So yeah. there was photo reference as well, but there was a lot of uh, scenes where I was kind of going, I, I can I know the street, I know the, the type of place he's looking for. So it was more that than, than it's, 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 the geography of it was sort of all over the place. You know, there was that sort of effort, you know, to, to try and it normalise well. it yeah. and, you know, just uh, try and make it real, yeah. you know. After an absence making comics, Davey returned with a strip called Thunderbags. I uh, lost my eye to cancer and uh, so I had to, had to go and get my eye removed in Sheffield and, uh, you know, I was thinking to myself, you know, I wonder will I still be able to draw, you know, and I had a big page of, uh, you know, really nice paper it was from, from uh, DC Comics, um, so I thought to myself, I'll just uh, start drawing, more of a doodle type of thing. And I drew these, you know, characters, a mixture between the Avengers and the Justice League, uh, only more sort of down at heel. And then, uh, then I thought to myself, I'd, I'd like to start, you know, getting into the comics again, because I'd been sort of away from them for a while. I was doing caricatures and, you know, different types of thing, a wee bit of advertising work and that. So um, it was nice just to get back into the comics and uh, there's so many ways you can tell a story through comics. You know, if you if you had 10 people in a room and ask them to tell the same story, give them the same script, you'd get 10 different variations. It's, it's just like, you know, it's just so different, you know, and it's, it's such a, it's just such a good medium, you know. <laughs> Jim McEvitt currently runs a store, Atomic Collectibles, and has fond memories of the Belfast comic scene. Okay. I brought in a few mini comics at shops like yours might have stocked back in the day. Yeah, th this is sort of independent. Like homemade comic was the type of thing that, when we first started, there wasn't any specialist stops, so it were more like a market stall and a variety market. So you get people who do the homemade, self-published and printed. 
in the comic would bring up a bunch in and go, could you try and sell these for me? And you find more than that, if you did, they didn't even want the money. You know, they just wanted uh, the fact that people could sort of see them and talk about them and pass them around, get a bit of a scene going in Belfast. It's created that history of locally produced independent comics and artists and writers. There's like a shared confidence there, and it's, a, it's like a foundation, stepping That's right. stone. Yeah, so. it gives them that confidence that they can do it. They're, even if they're only doing it for themselves, they feel it's a bit, there's a feel that, well, it'll have a wider audience, because there's a few more places around now, it will stock it. Jim, your store is multi-catering to collectors of comics and vinyl and books and other curiosos. How do you think this variety affects business and community? Well, it affects business in the way that not one particular thing, such as a comic or a record, is enough for these days to sustain a business, what with the internet and all that there. So we've always had comic shops, but I find business ways you need a variety of things to keep it going. And also people who are in the one are more likely than the other, that sort of age group. And it affects the community in a way that other than the big multi-stores, there's not a lot of choice for to get that variety and, and the more unusual thing that people might want. PJ Holden and Patrick Brown are two artists I've worked with, each publishing our own comics during the mid-90s. We've enjoyed differing critical success, departing from our small press roots. PJ, for example, has followed in the footsteps of Belfast's Will Simpson in drawing both Judge Dredd and Rogue Trooper for 2000 AD a pivotal position in British comics. First thing I did um, in the small press world was per chance. It was all games and um, role playing games and stuff, but it was the very first thing I ever, I ever had published, which was about 1991. All hand photocopied and sold around Queens and uh, role playing conventions that went on. The thing is, that, first of all, this was pre-internet days. You, you find that um, magazines like Not Screws, Washers and Bolts had almost nothing to do with the other stuff that yeah. was turned up just immediately and barely after. Barely existed. Yeah, and, and neither of them knew each other existed, really. And then after that domain, uh, which I did a strip called Witch Hunter, I think it was called, um, which would then later turn up again in DNA Swamp. <laughs> so it would, there was a constant sort of dipping in and dipping out of, of, of the things. The truth of it was that the number of people buying these things was, was essentially the same people who were printing them and selling them. There was, yeah. not, there was not a wide audience for any of this stuff at all. I do it was remember. Just, it was just the thrill of having, having a comic with you. Yeah, yeah I, remember, I remember a big argument about whether they should have a colour cover or not, because a colour cover was, was effectively doubling the price of, <laughs> of, of the, of the comic. selling out. Yeah, yeah. And then the second issue, I kind of, because everyone's, you know, everyone's a student, everyone's about 21, 22, and everyone's a bit flaky anyway, and, <laughs> and you sort of, you flake out of it, and then reading the next month's editorial, it was slightly vitriolic to the, <laughs> to the people that had managed to flake out, reading it and shrinking down into my chair going, oh no, this is time, oh, do I feel really bad. <laughs> I went to college then, and kind of left comics behind really until DNA Swamp, which would, would have been 97, I think. About then, yeah. Yeah, until DNA Swamp, and, and then pulled out of the drawers uh, The Witch Hunter. I got more heavily involved with DNA Swamp than I intended though. They, they, um, they didn't have any, anyone doing graphic design or anything, so I kind of kept volunteering and going, I'll, I'll do that, let me do that, I'll do that. <laughs> Harry, you uh, were pretty much on your own. You were doing things like uh, Tomorrow Night and a Virtual Circle. Yeah, I kind of I came, kind of came into it through the British small press, oddly enough, because I'd been a student in England, and I really wasn't aware of what was much was, what was going on in, in Belfast. But I think back then I wasn't really much of a joiner. I think I, I was kind of, I had my own very strong ideas, not exactly of what I wanted to do in comics, but more of what I didn't want to do. And eventually I just decided I'll just do one on my own. It was a virtual reality thriller. That was quite a popular idea back in the 90s with the whole virtual reality and networks and kind of pre-internet, a kind of a vague idea of what the internet might become. So I kind of, I wrote my own VR thriller and I improvised it in ink. And some of it looks dreadful, but uh, it, was, it was good training. I was around and I was doing uh, uh, Bob's, which was a bed sitcom um, set in Bangor. I was, I was quite interested in building up my own, my own skills, but also in being part of something, um, something bigger and having a lot of different people on board doing things. 
in the 80s, you know, having seen copies of Zimok, the, 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 inspira- the aspiration there seemed to be, let's just do something, it'll be awesome. Whereas in the 90s, the aspiration seemed to be, we have to do an ongoing it's, series it's of very 20 parts of, of whatever it was, and, and that's what it's going to be. And of course, you get the, I mean, most of them maybe get two or three. You know, every time somebody does part one of something, you know, you're instantly setting a, a very high bar for how much work you've got to do for, your, for, for the work. And knowing that a lot of these people only really enjoyed the creation aspect of it, it, kind of, it always struck me as mad that they were constantly doing, you know, multiple series. And then not only that, but relying on, um, you know, you would do, say, um, you would go, I'm going to do a 10 part series, and, but I'm only going to do 10 pages per strip, and now I need other people to contribute. Once a month meet of comics creators at the Cloth Ear allows the next generation to interact, network and cook up new ideas. And then they just shrink it down to... I'm here as part of the Comic Book Collective uh, from Belfast and Northern Ireland. We also, we also get together once a month and talk comics and general geek talk. You know, it, it, it's always comics at the start. Then eventually it's, you know, movies and, you know, it's sci-fi and books and everything. So um, but we, all, we all sort of get together and compare, compare por- portfolios and give us our tips and just generally enjoy the comic en- environment. Stephen Downing. Stephen Downing, yes, yeah. how's it going? Uh, um, did you use that? Yeah, I I was talking to Mal, you see, I, I don't know now about comics, yeah, yeah. and I just rung up Mal in the shop and he was telling me that around here, but, uh, he was telling me to talk to you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So. Are you the artist or writer or both? Or? Artist and writer, yeah. You see, I was doing screenplays that another, oh, okay. and, uh, so I decided to put all my irons in fire and just... I'd be one big fan. Yeah. Black and white, shape, yeah. <laughs> but are you you in the comics yourself, are you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Also, in the last sort of year, but moved on to like professional, like, like page page work or page bit stuff. So um, I did um, you know, Torchwood, the, the comic. Torchwood, yes. Uh, the yeah, thing. Yeah. I, I was the last thing I did, like I published, and then um, I've got an graphic novel coming out. It's, it's, it's like a creator own one, and then um, I'm, I'm doing some stuff for, for a couple down south so right. next week. Oh, and then there was, it was Andy thing was the one I was doing for the last for the last yeah. month. month. And Stephen and I worked together in absence comic about my experiences with epilepsy. It's a very meta comic. It's um, it's got characters falling out of panels, and uh, it's sort of spinning around. And it's a uh, narrator talking to the the camera as he as he recounts his life. So the, the challenge was to try and portray the same character throughout his age, but make him look consistent. So it, he still knew it was the main character, and then make make all the sort of meta stuff all work in the story, which was a lot of a lot of fun to do. So. So it's a bit, a bit different for me, but I think, it's, I think it looks good. I've had some good feedback, so.